Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Dugan. I'm a mental health pharmacist, and I am going to share a recording of the didactic today for the ICANN session. Our topic is, is there more to melatonin than sleep? This topic was brought up for the curriculum for this year because of some questions that we had gotten um, in the past year. My objectives for today, we're going to briefly describe the pharmacology of melatonin, and then we're going to list some conditions that melatonin may have beneficial actions for. It, for the record, we're not going to go into significant detail. There are a number of different potential uses for melatonin, so this talk is really designed to be a general overview. There's information for a number of these specific indications, um, and I'll talk about the ones that have more data than, than others, and each of them could be their own talk. So for our first go around with this, we're just going to do the general overview. Full disclosure, though, <clears throat> the discussion today really is going to be primarily off-label. Um, while Romeltian does have a formal indication for insomnia, that's going to be we're not going to spend a lot of time looking at the sleep indications. We're really going to look at some of the other uses and the other uses that are predominantly done using the supplement melatonin and not necessarily the prescription product. So I wanted to start at the beginning because I think this will help set the stage for looking at a number of different places that melatonin is being investigated in. Melatonin is one of the main hormones that's secreted by the pineal gland, but it also can come from a number of other secondary sources. It can come from the retina, the gut, skin, platelets, bone marrow. So we can see melatonin in a whole bunch of different places. It is synthesized from serotonin, uh, tryptophan to serotonin and a couple other enzymes then um, are necessarily are necessary to create melatonin. With that in mind, the synthesis of melatonin, the activity of some of those enzymes is on a circadian rhythm and it is inhibited by light. So just having light or using light therapy could really alter the amount of melatonin that's created. The amount of melatonin that a uh, individual produces also changes over time. We see significant fluctuations between individuals, but in each individual person, the amount of melatonin that you produce and what your cycles are of the melatonin tends to be relatively consistent and it follows a downward trajectory. So we see peak melatonin concentrations for patients between the ages of about two and six. That's when they're creating the most amount of melatonin. It then slowly decreases over time. There are patients who are older, above the age of 85 is what I saw, that may potentially not produce any melatonin at all, which is one of the reasons why looking at potentially supplementing melatonin may be beneficial for patients who are older that do have some insomnia issues. For the record, it doesn't appear that it's detrimental to patients to not have any melatonin. There have been a number of animal studies that have actually removed the pineal gland and reduced the amount of melatonin in some of those animal models to virtually nothing. They do see some sleep disturbances, but in other cases, they haven't found significant deficits if they don't have a normal amount of melatonin around um, circulating. The other piece that I wanted to mention is even though it's derived from serotonin, the synthesis of melatonin is also activated by norepinephrine receptors. So it really looks like melatonin works in conjunction with a number of our other neurotransmitters. And we'll talk about this as a teaser for a little bit later, but melatonin also appears to have some actions that interact with dopamine. So our three main neurotransmitters that we talk about a lot for treatment of mental health conditions all have links to melatonin. So how does it work? That's what it is. It's, it's circulating, it's floating around in our bodies. They've identified two specific melatonin receptors, MT1 and MT2. Now these are both G protein coupled receptors. They're found ubiquitously. There's a large concentration within the brain and the central nervous system. 
that's where most of the actions are, but there are also melatonin receptors in other parts of the body. So we can see it in the periphery, and there's a couple indications that we'll talk about later that are utilizing these specific, <laughs> these specific receptors, excuse me. They are both G protein coupled receptors. Melatonin one receptor has been found to decrease the production of cyclic AMP, one of our secondary messengers, and it increases the phosphorylation of mitogen activated protein kinase, and it also can increase potassium conductance. So activating one of the kinase enzymes could potentially result in a number of different activities downstream in the messaging cascade. Allowing an increase in the potassium conduction may potentially result in a lowering of the, um, the membrane potential, which may make it less likely than to depolarize and send messages on, which could interfere with some of the signaling, sometimes in a good way, potentially in a, in a not beneficial way for the uh, individual. The melatonin 2 receptor is associated with decreased cyclic AMP levels, as well as decreased CGMP levels. It also activates protein kinase C, and it decreases the calcium-dependent dopamine release in a couple different areas. They see it in the retina. They also see it in some of the reward pathways, which we're going to get back to in just a little bit. So again, both receptors working on different secondary messengers, but these are very, very active secondary messengers, which have the potential downstream to interact with a number of different neurotransmitters, as well as a number of other activities. In addition to those actions, it also has been identified that melatonin itself appears to be an antioxidant. It has some antioxidant properties. It can't do that to a tremendous extent, but it also appears to activate some other antioxidants as well as deactivate or um, diminish the activity of pro-inflammatory cytokines. So in addition to just these activities at the receptor, melatonin itself appears to be um, a messenger, maybe from at other receptors, not melatonin specific receptors, to help with some of these other actions. And those are going to be the actions that we see as the justification for potentially using this in other places. So looking at some of the melatonin associated functions, the first two, no surprise, sleep cycle, circadian rhythm disorder, that's where we see melatonin used most frequently jet lag, shift work, insomnia, those type, of, those type of situations. These next four are ones that are being investigated and have a good amount of literature support in animal type models. I recognize that we're not animal mo animals. However, this is really the justification for why it's starting to be used in some of these other places. And we're gonna look at each of these four additional boxes, mood disorders, learning and memory, neuroprotection and substance use disorder individually. So to start off with, with the mood disorders, the most amount of information is available for melatonin use as an adjunct for the treatment of depression. They were looking at knockout mice and other trials with, mostly with mice, um, and they found that in some of the mice that they had been subjected to for swim tests or um, some of the electroshock mazes, the, the symptoms of depression that they were demonstrating were diminished in, in the rats that were, or mice that were given melatonin. So then they wondered, okay, could melatonin be beneficial in depression? And they did some control trials looking at that specifically. It does not appear that melatonin alone is an antidepressant. So just giving melatonin doesn't appear to be enough to reduce a lot of depressive symptoms to a point where a patient would say, yes, I've responded, I'm better, um, I'm in recovery. But it seems to augment the other antidepressants that are being used to reduce the severity of symptoms and result in other neurochemical changes. This has been done predominantly with tricyclic antidepressants, SSRIs, and SNRIs. Not that it couldn't be used with others, but that those were just the classes that I saw it augmented with most frequently. Interestingly, there is um, 
Egomelatine is an international product. Um, we don't have it here yet in the United States that is an agonist for melatonin receptors and it's an antagonist for serotonin 2C receptor. This has demonstrated in clinical trials in humans improvement in depressive symptoms. They started investigating and actually melatonin 1 and melatonin 2 do have an interaction with the serotonin 2C receptor. So there appears to be a pretty close relationship between melatonin and the serotonin signaling which may be why this is being looked at as a target for a number of new antidepressants that are under development. None of them are quite ready for prime time just yet, but it does look that activating this melatonin symptom may be beneficial in patients, even if sleep isn't one of their main symptoms of depression. So that's one, one potential new indication for melatonin. Another area that they've been looking at is with learning and memory. There were a number of studies that were done that looked at individuals' performances, and they were looking at their cognitive performance, their focus and attention and concentration. These were done really to look at the impact of sleep deprivation, but they were also monitoring a number of other parameters. One of them was the melatonin levels. And what they found in those trials was that melatonin levels, as melatonin levels increased, there was a correlation with a decrease in focus and, in atten and attention, which makes a lot of sense, right? So if we're using melatonin to go to sleep, then maybe we're not as engaged with our environment. We're not really focusing on things. We're starting to kind of lay back and get into a relaxed place so we can drift off to sleep. That was identified originally. They then started looking at some of the dementia models, specifically looking at Alzheimer's dementia. And they found that different areas, specifically in the hippocampus, they saw long-term potentiation. So additional signaling that was happening with some neural circuits that created changes downstream. They found that the melatonin 2 receptor seems to be involved in long-term potentiation. They started looking at could we block some of the melatonin receptors and see a change in learning, memory, concentration, focus, attention? They've started doing some small trials. Most of them look at either attention or concentration type tasks, but they've also done a, a number that are looking at imaging. So just imaging on activity levels in different parts of the brain. They have have found changes in the signaling and the activity in a number of different brain areas, specifically those that are associated with concentration, focus, and attention, that did not clearly translate into changes in scores in some of the other assessments that they were doing. So there are there is interest in looking at this in two different places. One, in potential treatment of mild to moderate forms of dementia, if we block the melatonin receptors, could that have improvement? So there are a couple of trials that are ongoing looking at that. The other thing that they're looking at is the potential for blocking some of these melatonin systems in prevention of dementia or cognitive impairment. That one's going to take a lot longer, and there's a number of confounders. Not everyone is, we can't exactly predict who is going to go on to um, develop dementia or cognitive impairment. There are some genetic markers, but they're trying to work through some of those details to look on the prevention side as well. So as a supplement to potentially assist, not that it would remove the symptoms of dementia, but could potentially either prevent the development, which is what they're hoping for, or maybe somewhat beneficial in a patient who, with just a small advantage to focus and attention and concentration, memory is able to still stay independent. That's the other part that they're hoping for. So more to come on that, but those are, are currently underway. Our third category was looking at neuroprotection. This has to do with melatonin's ability to scavenge free radicals. It's able to grab some of those free radicals and it's thought to potentially be beneficial for inflammatory type conditions. They've looked at this in conditions such as multiple sclerosis. They're looking at it, <clears throat> excuse me, for treatment of depression. They've also looked at it for 
uh, bipolar disorder, in some forms of epilepsy, as well as in schizophrenia. Thinking that some of those conditions may potentially be caused by some degree of inflammation or damage from radicals within, um, within the brain. There's not a lot of support at this point to be able to say, yes, this definitely is neuroprotective and we should put patients on this to protect their brain if they're at risk, but they are looking at this a little bit more broadly. In addition to directly scavenging some of the free radicals, as I mentioned previously, it can induce antioxidant genes. It can inhibit it some mitochondrial cell death pathways. So if there is some excitotoxicity or um, damage to some of the neurons that's going on that we really didn't want to occur, it looks like this may interfere with it to some extent, and it seems to promote neurogenesis. This hasn't been well developed in humans yet, but they are looking at this pretty intensively in, um, in animals. So with the neurogenesis, they're hoping for looking at potential improvement in pain pathways, those that have traumatic brain injury. So they're, they're hoping for big things here, but we'll see what, what those trials eventually tell us, um, if it's somewhat neuroprotective or if we could really use this more clinically. The last area that had been identified was its potential role in substance use disorders. They found that melatonin use could potentially change the amount of dopamine that's being released. And it could be the amount of dopamine that's being released in the reward pathway. So if this is able to interfere with that positive reinforcement of the reward pathway, it could potentially interfere with that reinforcing behavior that's associated with substance use disorder. They've been looking at this again, mainly in animal models. And they found that in knockout mice, those that did not have any melatonin receptors at all, they had a reduced preference for methamphetamine. So they would put animals in these areas and administer, when the light came on, um, they would administer either methamphetamine, sometimes cocaine, sometimes opioids, um, sometimes benzodiazepines. And the animal would learn, hey, if I push on this lever, the light will come on, I get this dose of drug. It seems that in the knockout mice who didn't have melatonin activity, they were much less likely to continue trying to activate that and get dosed than the individuals that did have um, a functioning melatonin sy system. Still, again, really, really early, um, but a potential, again, adjunct, maybe not going to be able to completely prevent the development of substance use disorder, but maybe a potential adjunct and something additional we can add to the arsenal to assist patients who do have substance use disorder. The two main areas that they had information was looking at stimulants and at opioids. Um, there was more stimulant data than opioid data. So potentially looking at recommendations um, for the use of a, a stimulant use disorder in the future. Now, those were the ones that had been identified as they were looking at different animal trials and potential conditions that were suggested. There are a handful of other conditions that have been identified that could be beneficial for melatonin where melatonin is being used. One of them is in cancer treatment. There are a number of reports of adjunctive melatonin use in patients who are undergoing chemotherapy. Melatonin itself appears to have oncostatic actions. It appears to um, interfere with the continued growth of the cancer itself. Most of them are solid cancers. I did not see too much in terms of liquid cancers for the supplementation of melatonin. The other reports that um, supplemental melatonin have, have created is that it enhances the efficacy of chemotherapy for the treatment of those cancers. Um, breast cancer, prostate cancer had the most amount of data that I saw. It also appears to improve anxiety, depression, and toxicity from chemotherapy treatment. So those patients that were on supplemental melatonin seem to report less of those symptoms than those that were just on the same chemotherapy regimen which is interesting. So supplemental melatonin is being used in different practice settings for ad additional benefit um, in these patients. 
From a side effect perspective, there doesn't appear to be a large toxicity concern. So it, it nor is there a big interact drug interaction. So it seems to be a really good match for that particular patient population. Two other areas which I. I was aware of the oncology and I'm aware of the last one we're gonna talk about, but these two were really a surprise to me. It's been found because of its actions um, in being able to scavenge free radicals as well as diminish pro-inflammatory cytokines. Melatonin is being investigated to supplement the treatment of a number of different pulmonary diseases, including asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, so COPD. The thought is there are a number of inflammatory pathways that are happening with asthma that in some cases, even with the medications that we have are not well controlled. So they're looking to supplement the treatment with melatonin to see if that will be an additional factor to help tone down that inflammation and get better control of those asthma symptoms. On the COPD side, they're looking for more early intervention of, with melatonin to interfere with the destruction of the pulmonary tissue and the development of that um, more fibrosis and, and less usable um, lung tissue. It's still early. There are a, a few case series that are out there, but it is being looked at um, for, the, for the treatment of these conditions, the additional adjunctive treatment of these conditions. So not as a standalone, but kind of something in addition to everything else. There is also a little bit of data looking at the use of melatonin in patients with cardiovascular conditions, specifically looking at heart failure. Again, trying to capitalize on these antioxidant properties and scavenging of pre free radicals and reducing some of the inflammation post-stroke, uh, acute CHF exacerbation, as well as um, post-MI, including in most of the data that I saw was actually in patients who had just recently undergone a surgical procedure. So cardiovascular patients, pulmonary patients, with the indication of trying to improve those and not just address the insomnia for, um, for those patients, which I thought was really interesting. Again, that was supplemental with everything else that the patient was taking. We have one last um, potential area. This one's a little different, and that's why I gave it um, a slide all of its own. So they have been using melatonin for the treatment of headache disorders. This is different because it's not just adjunctive. They're actually looking at melatonin as a standalone treatment for headache disorders. The two that have the best data at this point are cluster headaches as well as the prevention of migraine headaches. For cluster headaches, there are some randomized controlled trials that demonstrate some improvement with the addition of melatonin. The doses have ranged anywhere from one milligram supplements to over 10 milligrams daily of melatonin to assist with the cluster headaches. In some of the clinical trials, they've seen an improvement of threefold. So the melatonin group was three times more likely to break their cluster headaches than the patients that were on placebo, which is really beneficial because we don't have as many treatment options as we would like for cluster headaches. In terms of migraine prevention, the, there are a few clinical trials. They're looking, they look both at um, episodic as well as chronic. Mostly um, the episodic, the ones that have really, really severe headaches, they're looking to reduce the severity of them. Most of it, most of the information was in the chronic migraine um, population because they're looking at the reduction in frequency of migraine headaches. Just one of these trials, it was a small trial, it was done in 65 adults that did have chronic migraines. They were followed for three months and they were put on one of three options, melatonin three milligrams at bedtime, amitriptyline 25 milligrams at bedtime, or placebo. The chart on the right-hand side here shows the reduction in headache frequency. Both amitriptyline and melatonin were statistically significantly more efficacious than placebo. So the patients in the placebo group over three months had a reduction from their baseline headache frequency of only one. So if they were experiencing 10 headaches, um, they went down to nine. 
For the melatonin group, they were a reduction of almost three, and the amitriptyline group was a reduction of two. Now, that's they did not do a comparison between the two. It's not to suggest that melatonin is more efficacious than amitriptyline. As you'll notice, they did a fixed dose of only 25 milligrams. Um, many patients who do use amitriptyline for migraine prevention do need um, higher doses, but they did see a significant reduction. It's been included in the migraine um, treatment guidelines as a potential option that could be used if patients are not getting efficacy or unable to tolerate some of those other preventative um, treatments. So it, it, this has been picked up by neurology and tends to be used as an option, um, not, not necessarily infrequently. So as a standalone, you could see patients who maybe are prescribed, but more likely they're recommended to get a, an over-the-counter melatonin product and to use it for their migraine prevention. So in summary, um, melatonin is a really interesting chemical. It has a number of different actions in the body. It, it appears to interact with a number of different neurotransmitters and may potentially have roles in quite a few different both neurologic um, psychiatric as well as medical conditions. There have been activity, antioxidant activity, anti-inflammatory activity, anti-nociceptive activity that, that have been identified and are really trying to be leveraged to improve care for some, some patients. Adjunctive treatment roles, maybe in depression, memory and concentration, oncology treatment, and pulmonary and cardiac conditions. And as a standalone option, it is being looked at to be incorporated more fully in the treatment of headache disorders. So thank you for your attention.